Welcome back, everybody, to The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi. And today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest. She has her own podcast on our community. She has um, a great reputation for helping others when it comes to parenting. She has She's really into parenting without punishment. And she is an author of the book, A Gift of Punishment, Free Childhood. And today she wants to talk about time management without punishment. And she's here today. And Rebecca, like always, it's such a pleasure to have you back. I really look forward to hearing about this because I think it's so important that we learn constructive ways on how to parent. And parent being a good parent doesn't mean that we have to yell at our children or punish them or put them in the corner or give them time out, you know, where they sit on a chair all by themselves. There are lots of constructive ways to parent. And, you know, and as a parent, we all know that we get frustrated, especially if you have more than one child or you just have a hard time because your day is so busy and they're juggling so many hats at the same time. So I want to hear what you have to say when it comes to time management, because being a parent, that's all it's about. You have to really learn how to manage your time appropriately because we live in such a busy life, you know, and we have to learn how to not let the world around us frustrate us and frustrate our child. And we have to learn how to really incorporate ways to, you know, live life with our family without frustration. And if we have frustration, how to, you know, ways to overcome it. And, you know, today I'd like to hear about the time management because that's something people struggle with all the time. Yes. Well, it's good to see you, Stacy, And thank you for having me today. Um, I'm very excited to share more information about parenting without punishment. And today really want to focus on how we help our children learn time management. You know, I think that one of the challenges that we face sometimes is we expect our children to, to know how to do this, right? That with that, without any help or any support, they should just be able to get out of bed on time and they should be able to finish their homework on time and get to the dinner table on time. And what uh, we've learned, right, is that children are developing throughout their lives. And as you said, all of us continue to work on time management, right? Even as adults, we sometimes struggle with it. And so uh, one of the messages that I like to share with parents is, Children are learning this right alongside you. And if you are, are strict and not supportive of helping them learn time management, it ends up being just power struggles within the family. And so awesome. today I would love to just share some ideas, have some conversation around how do we support our children in learning time management? I'd love to learn lo more about that because I, you know, I see so many parents struggle with time management. I see, you know, so many kids, you know, get frustrated, parents get frustrated. It's just, it's really hard, um, you know, when you don't know how to manage your time appropriately and we all try to do our best, you know, but it's very easy to get distracted. I hear that all the time. I hear that, you know, many people, um, you know, time goes by so quick. I don't know what happened. And then before you know it, oh my God, it's time to pick up Jody, you know, from the bus stop. Oh my God. You know, I, I have to, you know, soccer practices and, you know, we have, you have to get going. It's a 15 minutes. We can't be late, you know, and, you know, so many things, you know, get in, in the way of life. And, you know, if we have to really manage our time, what are some time management skills that we should really incorporate into our daily lives? So people don't get as frustrated. There's less stress in the house. Household, the child has less stress, the parents have less stress, you know, what are some of the things that we could do that would have a really positive effect? Right. That's a great question. So really, you know, I think being aware of it is the, is the first step, right? Recognizing when we're getting into those patterns of maybe always being late or getting into a pattern of, um, always being rushed. Right. And this is true for both our kids and for us. And so when we find ourselves in those situations, there are some things that we can do. You know, one of the things that I talk about in my book is making sure that you do give yourself and your children enough time. Um, yes. I think mornings are an excellent example of that. If you're finding yourself rushing out the door, um, you know, everybody under stress, shift your morning routine so that everyone gets up 15 minutes earlier so that it doesn't have to be so stressed. Right. Yes. So really be kind of aware of, of what that timing looks like. And then you mentioned something that that is important. And, and you, you said, you know, a lot of times we get distracted, 
but, but what we find with children is that they, you know, all of us have experienced being in the flow, right. Where we get completely engaged with something. Um, it's usually something that refreshes us and makes us feel better. Yeah. Well, children actually can get into the flow much easier than we can. So in many ways, it's a very positive attribute that our children get so engaged and in the flow with, um, you know, maybe they're working on a project, um, maybe they're doing something with a friend. And so helping them to, um, one, recognize that. And, and, you know, one of the things that I share frequently is just use observations when you're, when you're talking to your children, you don't need to, um, use accusatory uh, questions, right? Um, and so you can just come up and say, Hey, it looks like you're really engaged right now with your friend or with that project, right? Just make that observation and then remind them, Hey, you know, we, dinner is going to be on the table in 15 minutes, or remember that we need to leave for soccer practice. And by giving children that window of time, you know, and you can even say, you know, now is a time to bring that project to a close or a good stopping point so that we can leave on time and not be rushed because again, they're still learning how to do this. You know, if if we go in expecting them to just be able to drop what they're doing in an instant, when we say, okay, we got to go, um, it's very, very challenging for them. And it, and everybody ends up being frustrated. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's really hard when the kids are frustrated, the parents are frustrated, you know, um, and that's when fights occur and that's when, you know, they start, you know, the child said something and then the mother or the father is like, what did you say? And, and then all of a sudden everything gets out of control and, you know, you really have to, you know, figure, I guess, you know, the, the best ways of, of, you know, to, to manage your time. And, you know, sometimes I see people like, you know, they will put like um, sticky notes on the refrigerator, you know, they'll, they'll put, you know, things to do, you know, um, they will, you know, go over, maybe have a sit down and say, you know, this is what I expect, you know, this is what we're looking for and have a conversation. So your child knows what, you know, needs to be done and why it needs to be done and why it's so important that it gets done this way, you know, and then maybe have, have certain consequences, you know, not to threaten them, but, you know, if you can't, you know, do this, you know, then there's going to be consequences and maybe your phone will get taken away, you know, for, for a day or so, maybe you'll get your tablet taken away, you know, either you, you do this or you do that, you know, or there's going to be, you know, consequences and, you know, being able to just, but, you know, but I'm going to give you chances to do it the right way. Maybe you don't react right away. You give them, you know, cause we all make mistakes, even humans, you know, you give them a couple of tries, you know, but if the behavior continues, maybe then you start putting in the consequences. Okay. You know, I gave you, you know, I told you several times not to do this now, you know, you're not going to be able to use your phone for the day, you know, or something like that. Do you like that idea or do you think that's constructive? Well, you know, I think that that is a, it's a very common practice. And, but what I see happening is we're really using the term consequence as a, a cover up for punishment, right? Because when we say, Um, you know, and let's just use taking out the trash. So, um, a child's, uh, responsibility to help out around the house is to take the trash out and they neglect to do that. Mm -hmm. And to say, well, if you, you know, if you miss it again tomorrow, then I'm taking your phone away. And that's Mm -hmm. a consequence when in actuality, it really is a, a punishment, right? It's a, it's a threat to say, if you don't do, what I say, right. Then I'm going to punish you. Right. And, and that's what builds up that, that paradigm of punishment and where people then go out into the world and say, well, if people don't do things the way I think they should be done, then I am justified in punishing them, which is really the big goal of my book is let's look and see if we can't shift how our children view the world. Right. And, and remove that punishment paradigm. So let's take now, it doesn't mean that there aren't any natural consequences and it doesn't mean that they can just not take out the trash. So Mm -hmm. let's, let's look at it. Look at a couple of things there that uh, we can discuss. So one with the trash, remember if, if you can create that relationship with your child, that's supportive, right? I think that that goes a long way. So let's say 
uh, let's say they forget the trash. So one of the things you can do is say, Hey, I noticed you forgot to take the trash out. Right. And we had agreed that that was going to be your uh, responsibility. Um, is there something I can do to help you remember, right? So you're there to support them in being able to do what you've asked them to do. Right. And so maybe what you do is say, listen, I'll help out and I'll pull the trash bag out of the trash can and tie it up and put it out where you can see it. And then that way, when you're going out the door, you can remember to take the trash out. So Mm -hmm. finding ways to work with them and help them to, um, to be able to see what, um, you know, that this is a responsibility that they have to do. And you're building that relationship with them. Right. You know, and another idea that can work well is to, let's say, you know, uh, let's say that their job is to, to feed the dog. Right. And so this is something that can't be missed, right? Right. We, we can't not feed our, feed our pets. So <laughs> you feed the, as a parent, you feed the the dog. Cause you notice that your child left the house or, you know, ran to the bus stop without feeding the dog. And so then that evening, right. And you want to be very calm about this, right. Say, Hey, I've noticed you have, haven't fed the dogs the last couple of mornings and that has fallen to me. And yeah. so, you know, how about, because I've had to give up my time to do that. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about something that you can do for me to kind of pay me back for that time for me helping you. Right. And then you have that conversation about, you know, it's my job to unload the dishwasher. Can you do that for me tonight? Since I've fed the dogs for you this morning, right? That becomes a natural consequence, right? Where you're kind of repairing your error by helping out the person who helped you. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I think the other thing that's very important is that it isn't up to the parent to say, here's what your job is going to be, right? It needs to be a family conversation. So to sit down with the family and say, okay, here's all the chores, all the things that need to happen, right? And you can say, I know, you know, this child may, you know, because we've, we've all, all children are different. Yeah. I had children who hated to clean and I ha- had children who loved to clean. Right. Yeah. And so you want to make sure that you align the chores with what that child strength is. And so you yeah. have that conversation about somebody might say, okay, I, you know, I'm happy to take the trash out every morning. And when uh-huh. they are the ones who come up with the idea and are engaged in the process of what does this look like in our household, it yeah. goes a long way in them following through with that chore. I like that. And and it seems like it also will build the bond between the two people, you know, the child and, and the parent. And also, I think also it will build a respect factor, which also helps build the love factor too, you know, because when you, you know, show like, if you, if you threaten or you, you, you give those consequences, you're also, you know, you're building a wall up between the child and the parent, because then there, the anger comes in and resentment might come in, you know, you don't understand and, you know, you're, you're not, you know, you don't get, you know, why, you know, and, and then the negative emotions might come in and the repressed emotions, which might build into something else later on, you know, because a lot of times, you know, kids will slam the door, they're angry, but they're fearful of saying what they really feel. And then it becomes regression, regression, regression over the childhood years. And, you know, so many people that, ha- you know, we I think it's over 70% of the United States comes from dysfunctional families. And it all roots back most of the time from traumatic events or childhood instances that were related to how they were raised as a child, you know, because a lot of times parents don't realize how we raise our child, even arguing in front of our child, um, you know, how we respond to our child. Are we talking to them? Are we yelling at them? Are we threatening them? All these things, you know, regress into their adulthood years and even affects their self-esteem. And, you know, and a lot of people that have a lot of issues in their adulthood years, it's because of the way their childhood years, you know, resulted. And it was the way the parents were actually raising the children. And that's how they learned from generation before generation. And it carries on until the cycle is actually broken. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I think one of the things um, that I is also important for parents to think about is it's not about you. It's right. They, yeah. and, and we've all fall into this, right. I am certainly guilty as well is 
let's say that a child doesn't come to the dinner table on time, right? It's natural for us to say, why are they ignoring me? Or don't they respect me, right? We make it about ourselves when in fact, most of the time the child is just busy or has just, maybe they're not hungry and they're not motivated to come to the table, right? And so they need that extra prompting, but it's so easy for us to make it about us When in Mm -hmm. fact, most of the time it is not children do not wake up in the morning and say to themselves, I think I'm going to figure out a way to today to make my parent mad at me. Right. They just don't, they don't have that cognitive ability. So we kind of project that on them and say, you know, they're ignoring me or they don't respect me or they don't value me or they don't listen to me. Right. Don't make it about yourself. Yeah. Is another key component of learning how to, how to support children without punishment and how to discipline without punishment. And what about, you know, I remember when I was raising my kids, one of the things that made me so frustrated was, is when you make dinner and you're yelling for your child to come to dinner, you're like, you know, come on, it's time for dinner, you know, and you know, they don't come, they're not, they're busy, you know, either talking on the phone or they're, you know, they're involved in something else and, you know, they come when they please. And then the parent gets frustrated because the parents in the kitchen, they're making dinner, they're preparing dinner. So it takes about one to two hours. If you really take take the time and look at the clock, you know, a good hour and a half, let's say is, you know, hour time have to prepare and make dinner for your your family and then when when you when your your kids or even your husband doesn't come to the dinner table you're like you feel unappreciative so that unappreciative feeling stirs up emotions within yourself because uh, you know you're you're running around trying to hold everything together as a parent and you might have a job so then you're tired you know and then you're running around bringing the kids everywhere they have to go and then you know so it's like you know, I'm doing this for you. Don't you appreciate me? You know, don't, can't you just have the courtesy to come downstairs when I call you for dinner? You know, how do you deal with that? Yeah. You can see how that becomes about you, right. Is feeling unappreciated on, right. So kind of stopping and saying, wait a minute, this probably isn't about me. They probably really do appreciate me. It's just right now in this moment, they're not coming down. So a couple of things there. One is definitely for dinner. There needs to be that warning right? Whether it's 10 minutes, 15 minutes to say dinner in 10, right? Please, please, you know, get, get to a point where you can stop and come down to dinner, etc. Yeah. Now that's perhaps may not, may not work, right? It, it may work sometimes, but not always. And so yeah. I think what you just did is uh, an, an example of what you can do. And that's to share with them why it bothers you so much. Right. Mm -hmm. And to say, you know, and this is a life skill because not only, you know, they'll have potentially partners that cook for them. They'll be at a friend's house where another family cooks for them, you know, all of those situations, it's not just at, at home. And so to have that conversation about when somebody puts in this much time on something, they really do want you to, um, to, to be at the table in more than one way, right. To be there and to be present and to come when it's time. So the, you know, I've worked hard on this food and I want you to enjoy it while it's still warm. Right. And Mm -hmm. so I think having that conversation so that they understand the why, and I think that that helps considerably, because remember, we want our children to do the right thing because of an internal motivation right? I, I want to be good to the people around me, or I want to be responsible, not an external, because if I don't do this, my parent is going to yell at me. Or if I don't do this, um, you know, I'm not going to be able to talk to my friends on the phone tonight or whatever you want it to be internal. So yeah. you set a very good example, right? Is explain to them why it's important to come to dinner on time. Right. Now, you know, another important factor I see is procrastination. Like for a lot of times when, when kids are younger, you know, they procrastinate, they, they do things on their time, not on the time that their parents would hope they do do things. They might ask them, like you said, to throw out the garbage three hours later, they might throw out the garbage or they might even wait till the next morning or even forget. 
you know, but procrastination is, is a lot that you see in children. And sometimes they grow out of it, but sometimes they carry it into their adulthood years. And when your child is always procrastinating or they're slow as a snail, you know, what can you do when it comes to time management to actually break them out of that procrastination cycle and mm -hmm. really get them on a, on a, on a, 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 um, a, a time management or an organized way of thinking where they can actually get out of procrastination because a lot of times I've seen, I've seen people grow out of it plenty of times, you know, as they get older, they, they go to college or they, they get a trade, they get a job and they become more responsible and they realize I got to up my game because if I don't, I'm going to get fired. If I don't, this is going to happen. There's going and, you know, so they, they, they change the way they do things, but then you see people also in their childhood years, they procrastinated and then it brought them into their adulthood years with the same behaviors and then it affected them in, in their adulthood years. So how do you, if you see your child procrastinating, how can you constructively in a, in a positive way, break them out of that procrastination? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And so one of the things I do want to bring to this question is that we have learned with uh, some of our um, neurodiverse children um, yeah. as particularly ADHD, right? That that is a component of, mm -hmm. of that particular way of being right. And, um, like I always, like I, I had a daughter and, and she does have ADHD. And for a long time, I'm like, you know, why, why is it so hard for her to, to, well, and what, how I described it is she couldn't rush right? Yeah. Like most of us, if we're like, oh, I'm late for that meeting, right? We can rush and do that. It's almost like it wasn't even something that she could do even if she wanted to, right? right. So I mm -hmm. recognize that early on. And so know that it's not, and again, this brings it back to, it's not about you. It's not that they're not listening to you. This is about them and what's happening. Now, to your point, this, this is something though that can harm them later in life, right? If they don't figure out um, kind of how to do, to work with this. And so that's how you should see your role is not getting angry with them or forcing them to change or, you know, putting them under the gun. Um, your role really is to say, Hey, I can see that it's really hard for you to rush, or I can see that, um, it's hard for you to, to finish a project, right? That's something else that's very, um, common. And so then what you want to do is brainstorm and work with them on what are some things that we can do to help you, um, manage this, this kind of this way of being right. What are some things that, that could help you, um, to do this? And so, um, you know, I had, this was actually another daughter, but she, it was very, very hard for her to get up in the morning. Yeah. And so we could, and she was old enough at this point where we didn't even have to talk about it. She knew that it was her responsibility to get up. And so she yeah. found an app on her phone that made her do a math problem before the alarm would go off. So, right. It would make wow. her wake up enough to have to do a math problem. And then she was awake versus just having to hit a snooze button. Right. right. And so working with them on what could work, right. Whether it's, um, you know, one of the things that sometimes helps individuals is to make a checklist, right? Yeah. So let's make a checklist. The other thing that can be very helpful is let's break this down into smaller steps. Mm -hmm. A lot of times for children, um, a, an example that I use is a math worksheet that they bring home, like in third grade, right? Yeah. And it's just 20 math problems. And for some children, they look at that and they learn, it's just completely overwhelming, right? Yeah. And so of course they're going to procrastinate. But take a piece of paper, cover up everything but the first row and say, let's just do this first row. Well, that's right. manageable, right? And so any kind of project, any even writing a paper, right? Hey, let's just get the first paragraph done, right? Break it. It's called chunking, right? Break it down into chunks and yeah. help them learn how to do that rather than punishing them, right? You can just imagine that feeling of being a child and, and being frustrated because you're not getting your homework done and then having your parent be mad and yelling at you, right? It, it would, it would just exasperate it rather than make it better. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. I like that too. I, I think that's like very productive. 
when you can do things in in a, in a manner where um, you could help your child, because a lot of times pa- kids have, you know, they have either conditions or disabilities that parents aren't even aware that they have. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that happens so many times. Like when I was in the school system, you know, and, and uh, you know, I didn't work in the school system when my children got, went to oh, yeah. school, I was very involved. And, you know, they were, they were, you know, my children were having problems in certain areas. And when I went into school and they talked to me about it, I was very open. And at the end of the conversation, they, they were, they thanked me for being so open, taking the, taking the information in and actually, you know, um, agreeing to do some of the uh, courses and classes with the children that they offer to help them. And because, because most parents are in denial, you know, so it's instead, you know, instead of, um, you know, thinking one way and thinking that the kids have to do it this way and the kids should be doing this and, you know, Think about maybe they're reacting this way because there's something else going on. You mm-hmm. never know. You know, mm-hmm. it could be a symptom of something else. Just like, you know, um, your child had ADHD. A lot of, you know, a lot of parents were not aware that their kids had ADHD. A lot of, a lot of adults realize in their adult years that they had ADHD and then they went for help, you know, so it, you know, it carried through. So even the alarm with your daughter, I thought it is an excellent idea. I didn't even know they had alarms like that. Oh my goodness. That is awesome. I, you know, and, uh, you know, I think it's, it's so important that, that, you know, parents, you know, not so much react in a negative way or, or just get so impulsive because a lot of parents get frustrated very quickly take a breather, maybe do like a little, you know, breathe an exercise for a couple of seconds and then think about it. And then, you know, then try to approach the the issue, whatever the issue may be, because the things we were talking about are very common issues that all parents go through during these childhood years. And my kids, I'm an empty nester now, but my three kids, this, all these things were issues when my kids were growing up, you know, and they overcame it, you know, they, you know, they, you know, they were all, they were all, you know, I, I had two of them that, you know, one child, he would play video games all night even when in the I'd wake up and I think he was sleeping and then I go into the bathroom and I could hear the video games and I could hear the he's talking to his friends but he still got up early in the morning I'm like God help this child I'm what is he going to be when he grows up you know and (laughs) but he always got up for school he always got the grades and it was like so I instead of like you know arguing with him or you know I would go in there and I would be like time to go to bed, you know, and I would walk out of there because he knew that it was time to go to bed. I didn't have to yell at him. I didn't have to do anything. He knew what, what my expectations were. And, you know, but he, but he always got the grades. He always got up. So it wasn't that I, you know, there wasn't any need for me to, to react in a negative way because he still was doing the things he was supposed to be doing, even though he was staying up late when he wasn't supposed to, you know, everything else he was doing right. So, you know, I would remind him, but I wouldn't punish him. I wouldn't yell at him. I would just say, you know, it's time for bed. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> that's perfect. You know, so, you know, it's sometimes, you know, as long as your kids are meeting up to their responsibilities, you know, mm-hmm. you really shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't have to, you know, for every little thing they do wrong, you know, you, you know, get, get so angry or frustrated and just take a breather and see how different ways you could approach the problem in a, in a positive way. Because I do think, you know, you know, I, I, I've heard, you know, a lot of parents, this, you know, from the older generation saying, oh my God, do you see how these new, new generations raise their kids? Cause they're very into raising their children without punishment. You know, it's, it's a, it's a new thing that other generations are not used to. And, and when I first heard about it, I was like, no punishment. How are they going to realize when they do wrong? How are they going to, how are they going to, you know, realize, you know, you know, to stop doing the negative behavior or the bad habits that they, you know, they, that, that they continuously do, you know, and, and then I realized after, you know, talking to you and, and seeing the outcome and really thinking about it, I was like, you know what, everybody that's had that type of behavior repeated that behavior and it's actually had a negative impact on the on the future generations so you know maybe it is time to change the way we actually raise our children we, why do we have to punish a child and think about they even say the same thing about a dog you know back then they used to yell at a dog or they used to grab the dog by the ear and you know and and say no no and they tell you now these are things you shouldn't do to the dog because it traumatizes the dog and the dog 
actually, instead of growing and get that bond with you, it, it, it separates itself from you and it doesn't want to get close to you. So it's this, you know, this, you know, I'm, I'm just saying from an animal, a domesticated animal to a human being, it's the same reactions, the same emotional impact, the same, you know, the same results happen, you know, if you, if you're nice to the dog and you, and you tell the dog that wasn't, you know, that was a no, no. And, you know, the dog realizes right away, you know, like if you use a word or if you something, it realizes, oh, I did something wrong. Cause my dog, when he would do something wrong, she would hide underneath the bed right away. You know, and she knew she did something wrong. You know, I didn't have to yell at her. She knew that she did something wrong. And yeah. then, so then I would figure out a way to teach her how to not to do that, whatever she did wrong. Like if she made in the house, you know, by accident, you know, she would immediately hide underneath the bed and she would just look, you know, because she knew that she did something she wasn't supposed to do, you know, and, and instead of, you know, doing something that was negative, I would just, you know, work a little bit harder to try to make, to make a routine with her. And, and then I would commend her every time she did something, you know, that she did what she was supposed to do. And that, you know, that broke the cycle and that, you know, helped her continue the good behavior. So, you know, even though, you know, dogs are different than humans, they're actually very similar in a lot of ways. So if we actually are yelling at our children and we're, 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 you know, you know, cause it's still back in the day they used to pull the child's ear they used to get right oh, near yeah. their face and, and install the fear you know a lot of these you know parents still talk about you know their childhood years or they talk about when they went to catholic school and the, and the nun hit them on the hand you know if it wasn't traumatic they still they they wouldn't talk about it in their adulthood years so whether they joke about it or not it was still traumatic because they remember it you know that's so. exactly right yeah you know um what what you're really bringing up in in summary right is that whether it's a you know your your best four-legged friend right or your or your child we naturally want to connect with others right our dog naturally wants to our dogs naturally want to connect with us our children that's that is the number one thing they want right yeah. is to be connected to their yeah. parents and then of course to other people as they, as they mature. And so, um, you really don't have to use punishment, right? If you can right. just build and continue to build that connection, they want to collaborate and cooperate yes. with you. Right. So they're building that connection. And then the other thing you said that, you know, when you were talking about your son and your approach was, was perfect. And, uh, just want to come back to th th that's an example of when we do kind of look at natural consequences. You know, I, I always hesitate to say consequences because it gets misused, but yeah. there are natural consequences. Right. And so let's say that your son didn't do well in school, right. right. Rather than mm -hmm. punishing him, you could say, you have that conversation and say, look, the reason that you're struggling in school is because you're so tired because you're staying up so late. So yes. Let's talk about, you know, when is it okay to stay up late? Always give them something to, they need to win while you win and yes. say, you know, what if we set up a schedule where on, you know, Monday and Tuesday nights for sure, we, you know, turn off the lights and you're in bed early enough. And then you can stay up late on Wednesday and Thursday or, you know, whatever the situation is, but right. they're going to see that natural consequence of doing poorly in school. Right. Or they're going to yeah. see those bad grades, or they're going to, um, maybe if they're always late to soccer practice, they're not going to be able to play first string or, or whatever they, right. And so helping them see that the consequence of you, you know, not taking care of your soccer equipment so that you can get out of the door on time means that you're not, playing, playing as much soccer. So let's talk about how you can be more organized or let's right. So help mm -hmm. them see that consequence and then help them figure out how they can, because right. That's what you're doing is you're teaching them how to live in the world. Right. You know, and, and one of the things, and, and we say this every time you and I talk, but this is not about a parenting style where you, um, don't do anything right? It's not about, oh, just let kids do whatever they want. Yeah. This type of parenting style really is where in some ways it's more work, right? Mm -hmm. than, than just using punishment because you're yeah. truly engaging with your child and you're teaching, right? You're being that coach, that guide, that teacher. 
I think the biggest fear too is that they they they're worried that if their child continues this bad behavior it's going to affect them in their progress and their progression, you know, going into their teen years and their into into their college years or their you know where they put the part where they learn a specific type of job or trade, you know, and then go into their adult years, you know, because you know in a parent, you know, I always see them striving to make their children succeed or be the best they possibly can be, and their fear. I think it's the fear too if they don't teach. If they don't, if they don't stop their child right away from doing things they're not supposed to, their child isn't going to be a success. Their child isn't just going to succeed. Their child is not going to turn out, you know, the way they picture they want their child. Because I think, well, you know, I know even for me, when you know your children are born, you you always picture that 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 white picket fence and the perfect life you want your child to have. You know, it's it's not realistic, but it's yeah. like you know, you always think about it. In, your, in the back of your head because you want your child to to have that that fulfilling life and and every you want every that child to have all those opportunities so when you see behaviors start to occur I think in their childhood years it's right away that the parent reacts because they want to stop it right then and there and they get them back on track yeah and we know from so much of the literature now that operating from that place of fear is not typically the the way to be, right? If if we're letting fear drive our decisions or our actions, mm-hmm. you know, we know that that is is not typically, you know, we you need to come from that place of uh faith that that what you're doing, right, yes. is is correct, right? That that calmness, that you know, everything's going to be okay. I'm just going to help them because the the truth of the matter is is those children that are raised without punishment are actually much more likely to be successful in life mm-hmm. with whatever that looks like for them right we know that most people um use their relationship with their primary parent as yeah. and and this is not conscious this is unconscious they will mirror that relationship as an adult or sometimes respond against it but typically yeah. It's the same. So if you are a parent who's controlling or you're a, a parent that um, withholds love, right? If, if somebody's not doing what you want, um, they're going to end up in that same kind of relationship versus yeah. if you're a supportive parent, if you're a parent who has demonstrates unconditional love, I'm going to love you no matter what, yep. then that's the kind of partner. And so they're actually that success in life that meaningful life is much more likely if they've had that kind of experience as a child. And you see that all the time. I could look at so many relationships or I've worked with so many people that they've actually married or committed themselves to someone that represents their mother or their father, the personality, mm-hmm. whether they realize it or not, I'll, you know, I, once I've met the the father or I've met the mother, I'm like, and I see who the person they marry, they carry the same characteristics that that parent have, whether, and they probably don't even realize it, you know, and then, you know, even my son, he was like, now he's getting, he's getting ready to get married, but he's like, oh, you know, my, my, um, my fiance does X, Y, and Z, just like you do. And he jokes around that you <laughs> guys are so similar he and he laughs about it but i don't think he realizes the correlation that you know subconsciously you if you admire somebody or you even if you don't because i've seen many you know relationships where they've had negative parents and they've married or committed to the same type of parent if their parent was an alcoholic somehow they got involved with someone that was an alcoholic and carried those same type of characteristics and you see it all the time so yes you do uh, subconsciously mirror your parents a, a good percentage of the time without even realizing it yeah that is so true and it's because it's what you know right yes. it's where you're comfortable it's it's what you learned it's why you know you're now you're going to get me going, but it's why parenting is so important, right? It's one of the most important things we do. And it Uh, is one of the ways that we can change the world. Yeah. And, and, and it's funny because a lot of times I see like the older generation pushing the kids to have children and have children. New, this new generation is not so aggressive about having children and having mm-hmm. large families like the other generation. And I've said so many times, not everybody is meant to be a parent. Not everybody is, is meant to have large families. It all depends on the person's personality and what they really want for themselves. You know, you know and the older generation, you know, they think you have to have these big families, oh, the grandkids, but it's really, you know, 
it, what that it, can that person handle the stress? Can that person, you know, hold that responsibility? Does mm -hmm. that person really want children? You know, not everybody wants the responsibility of a child, child, you know, to have a child, and that's okay. You know, you mm -hmm. don't, you know, it all depends on who that person is, what their needs are, and what they want from life. You know, what and and you know, and and it needs that needs to be respected also. You know, and uh, you know, but this generation is definitely changing, and I see a lot of a lot of good things too. And I and if you had to really look at this conversation today, and you really want to emphasize on some important factors, what are some of the things that you think are really important that we should emphasize on today? Yeah, you know, I think that um, the the importance of of the conversation today is really about not making altercations with your children about you, right? Mm -hmm. Recognizing that they're doing the best they can with what they have in that given moment. And they mm -hmm. really aren't trying to get at you or upset you. So remembering that, remembering to that you need to kind of be the adult in this situation, bring mm -hmm. a sense of calmness, bring that perspective of you're just kind of observing, share what you see rather than backing them into a corner with questions that no one would want to answer, right? Um, to be supportive rather than controlling. And yeah. just to recognize, like we said at the beginning, everyone throughout our lives, we continue to learn about time management. And if you yeah. think about someone who's maybe only been on the planet for six years, eight mm -hmm. years, even 12 years, they're probably not very good at it yet. Yeah. And so just to have that compassion for our children as they learn about time management. I, that's, you know, hundred percent. I, I think those are great pointers to, to, you know, to, to express to the listeners today. Now tell everybody about the different services that you provide. Sure. So um, I provide uh, workshops on parenting for groups and, um, you know, we talk about it. They're very um, interactive so that people can share their, um, things that they're struggling with. Um, I also do one-on-one -on -one coaching for parents. And so I'm happy to, to help parents with that type of work as well. Um, and then of course I have my book, which would, I'd love to get that out there. I think there's, there's great information in there. And of course, all of this information is available on my website, which is rebeccawolf.com. I love it. And do you have a, a newsletter that you supply to people if they sign up as well? I do. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wonderful. So Yes. I love it. Well, this has been amazing. I, I love, you know, when you come on the show because you give such great insight because you, punishment is not necessary. And I think people have to break that, you know, out of their, their system because we've grown up with it for, for, for decades. And now is the time to break the cycle and start a new way of parenting, you know, and they're in, and it's not just your opinion. This is, this is, you know, based scientific based and research based information that has been, you know, proven, you know, by analyzing in research studies and, and it's shown to be, have a, a positive effect on raising children and breaking them from bad habits, bad, you know, bad behaviors. It's, and, and it's actually helping to, to, to help that child, you know, build a foundation to succeed in life and, and not have to have the, the trauma or the, or it, or the, the bad, you know, memories that we sometimes carry. And, you know, we do, like we said in the beginning, we want our children, we want our children to become adults and not have to have issues later on in life. Because a lot of times, as we said, you know, before I'm just repeating myself, a lot of it stems back to our childhood years. I think, you know, it was a good, good percentage. I don't know the percentage, but most of the time, everything goes back into you know, our childhood years, you know, and so we have to really take those childhood years that we raise our children and think about it. And the fact that, you know, our children mentor us and they look for people like us to be, have companions with is something we have to take into, into factor too. You know, and that takes time because we might have to look at ourselves and be honest with ourselves. Are there some things that I can improve in my own life that maybe I'm not doing so great? You know, because we're not perfect human beings. We make mistakes. You know, parenting is a learning process. You know, nobody's perfect at it as a, you know, so we, when we have interactions with our children and, and things don't work out perfectly, you know, not just look at our child's flaws, but look at ourselves and what did I do wrong? What can I do better next time? And I think that plays a a big role. So I think honesty is key when it comes to parenting. We have to be 
honest with ourselves and be willing to change as well. I love that. But I, I really, you know, thank you so much, Rebecca, for coming on the show today. I love having you here and I look forward to talking to you too in the future. And thank you so much. And everybody, Rebecca has her own podcast. Like I mentioned earlier, if you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment and Rebecca will be more than happy to get in touch with you and comment back. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yes. Thank you, Stacey.